wonderful presence of the Lord here. I've got some things I wanted to, to reiterate in the way of announcements, but I, I don't want to do that right now because I want us to flow in the Spirit of God in this place this morning. I asked the children, to, uh, Sister Stephanie asked me actually, if, the, uh, if we could forego children's church this morning, and I said, absolutely. I think it's good for the babies to be in church every once in a while. Amen. Amen. Children's church is a very, very valuable ministry, and we appreciate those that donate their time as well as, as youth ministries, but it's good to have them in service every once in a while. So we're, we're glad to have all of our younger ones with us this morning. Uh, it was said a long time ago that 20 years from the time that you hear the last cry in the nursery would be the death of your local church. So it's good to have the babies. It's good to have them making noises and it's good to have them talking out loud and, and, and all that stuff. That is a blessing in disguise. Amen? Amen. And for your younger couples... For your younger married couples, and those of you that are contemplating marriage in your future, listen, remember, we need the nursery full. Amen, that's, that's a good means of church growth. If you have your Bibles uh, this morning, I want you to turn them to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and of course we fully realize, I think, that this, this is the last Sunday before Christmas Day and the celebration that we will have. And, and some of you have been getting ready since Halloween. Our Christmas, Christmas shopping starts in our house on the day after Christmas sale. Sister Sarah, she goes in, you know, uh, she is a very frugal shopper. So from the shopping aspect, it starts real early around our house. She plays Christmas music in July, but Christmas is upon us, finally here, and uh, we're going to talk about some of those things as we go into the message. I'm, I'm using the New King James wording this morning uh, simply because it, uh, it, it's more familiar to us along the lines of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, verses uh, beginning... Uh, I think I gave you the wrong information, Dave. I am so sorry. I'm going to use more than just two verses. Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered, the King James says, taxed. This census took, first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Father, we ask that you will just bless, Lord God, the reading of your word and the ministry to come forth. And Father, right now I ask that you would not only anoint me, the servant to this great congregation, but anoint this congregation's ears to hear what thus saith the Spirit of the Lord this morning. Because God, we need to hear from you. We've worshipped you and, and you've visited us and you've been here among us. But now we want to hear from your word and your spirit. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled this message, The Simplicity of Christmas. I've spoke to how that most of us in this room, uh, a lot of you anyway, have started shopping several weeks ago, maybe even December 26, like Sister Sarah does. Many of you have uh, had your tree up since maybe Halloween or even before. Some of you have two or three trees in your houses. Some of you maybe you don't have any. But we all uh, know as we look around us, we can see that Christmas is, has changed a lot through the years. Um, you know, I want to I use a practice, a Christmas tradition, if you would. Christmas traditionally is a, a, a time of reminiscing. Christmas is a time of year when a lot of us will drag out the picture album and we'll look back at the pictures of of us from maybe back in the 80s and the 70s and, you know, in my case, into the 60s and some of you all beyond that. And you may look at those old black and white. Some of them are faded and yellow now. But they're pictures of Christmas's past. And you're seeing a lot of your loved ones that are no longer with you, perhaps that grandma, that grandpa, maybe even some of your siblings that are no longer with you. And and you reminisce, you reminisce. I reminisce about the first pair of cowboy boots that I got. They were black with blue tops. I remember them, remember them very vividly. I remember my, elect, my electric train, although it was used because a lot of the toys that we received when we were smaller kids um, were used toys, used bicycles. Never owned a new bicycle in my life, even to this day. The reality of it is, but we will sit back and we will reminisce in this Christmas time of year and, and, and we will share in the memories. And perhaps that, that we will find ourselves talking of Christmas's past and, and we will begin to entertain those thoughts of yesteryears and we will realize everything was just a tad bit simpler than it was just this year or last year. We will remember that, that Christmases past were very much different for us. We, uh, we didn't have all the hustle and bustle. We didn't have necessarily all the malls, all the stores. A department store, when I was growing up, there was a couple that was called department stores in and around Withville. I can remember it was, it was Tiny Trent's Crest Store. Tiny Trent weighed 300 pounds. And Tiny Trent had one level, and then you walk up to the other department, three steps, and you were in the other level. That was a department store. And so it was with some other places that we frequented in town. So Christmas did used to be a whole lot simpler. Everything basically stopped for Christmas season. For the most part, all of that is true. But commercial marketing and competitive thinking have actually molested the true meaning of Christmas. And the problem with that is, you and I have fallen victim to that. We have fallen victim to the molestation of Christmas. We have fallen victim. That's why we have found ourselves spending money that we don't have on people that really don't even care. And we find ourselves in a competitive state. We find ourselves in a circumstance or a situation wherein that, that, that Christmas has evolved into a time that is no, no longer just that solemn time of coming together to celebrate the birth of Christ, but Christmas to us has turned into a time of, uh, of spending money and, and running to and fro and, and doing this and doing that and, and, and finding ourselves all caught up in this hustle and bustle. And sometimes we even find ourselves this wishing and thinking, I'll be glad when it's all over with. Maybe some of you even here right now, you're thinking, praise the Lord, by this time next week it'll be all over. We find ourselves in those type of situations or that situation simply by reason of We've got caught up in the commercialism of Christmas. So we find that the birth of our Savior has been overshadowed with some of the celebration. And understand me, 
I like celebrating too. We just went with the grandbabies over the night before last and rode the Polar Express. All good, all well. I love trains. I love riding trains. I love riding planes. I don't like riding ships because ships ride in the water. Okay? But the reality of it is, there's nothing wrong with having those great times together. But, but let's understand and realize that that is not the true meaning of Christmas. That is not really what Christmas is all about. And when we find ourselves getting caught up in the pressures of buying and giving and, and even receiving and, and going here and going there and going to this Christmas party and this Christmas dinner. And, and, and listen, can I, can I say something to the, all the grandmas and grandpas in here? We've got to realize that our kids are growing up and those grandkids are growing up and they're not all going to be able to come to this grandpa and grandma's house and the other grandma and grandpa's house and great grandma's house and great grandpa's house. There's just not enough of us to go around on Christmas Day. So we get stressed. We get stressed. And you may have already heard this and, and know it, but if you do, I'm just going to reinforce it for you a little bit this morning. But so I've read, so I've been told, and I have friends that, that work in, in mental health, and, and I'm, I've been told that Christmas is usually the, the most stressful time of the year. There are, there are more, some friends that I have that work in the mental health in years past have told me that they get more calls, they, they're on call and they spend more hours, they, their caseload increases during the Christmas season because we're suffering from anxiety and we're suffering from depression and we're suffering from, from uh, Christmas, the Christmas season is the highest point in all the calendar year, Christmas season, the suicidal tendencies are at its height during the Christmas season. It's all because we have allowed secularism, carnal thinking to overshadow what Christmas really is. So this morning, I want to preach to you and I want to bring three points to you in concerns to the simplicity of Christmas. The simplicity of Christmas. Maybe more. Maybe Christmas would mean just a little bit more if we realized it in its simplicity. I, I didn't write the quote down and, and I, I can't remember it in its exact form this morning. But, but even the old Scrooge. How many of y'all know the Scrooge? Even, even the Scrooge, your mean one, Mr. Grinch. Mr. Grinch. How many know Mr. Grinch? Even the Grinch said this. The Grinch said, the Grinch said that, that maybe, just maybe, Christmas wasn't just toys and gifts, but maybe that Christmas was just a little bit more. So the simplicity of Christmas, number one, God uses simple people. Now, I don't mean simple in the, the capacity of their mentality. You know, used to people that were mentally challenged would be called sometimes simple-minded, and I'm not referring to that at all. I'm referring to God uses simple people. Simple people. There were many important people in Palestine at the time that God made the announcement that he would become incarnate. There were great scholars. There were great intellectuals. There were great rulers with great power and they were in command of the elements of the earth. But God did not choose to use any of those people to tell and to announce his coming. In fact, the angels came and they came to simple people. They came to simple people like Martha and Mary and Elizabeth. They came to simple people like 
Joseph, we'll talk about more later. God came to simple people. And as he came to simple people, it was those simple people that would carry the good news of the gospel. The good news that Jesus was coming to earth. It was a simple girl on Sister Pam mentioned a a young girl. It's believed that that Mary was no more than maybe 14 to 16 years old at the very most. She she was a poor girl. Nobody really knew who Mary was. She was a simple young girl and she was betrothed to a simple man, Joseph, a simple carpenter. Worked with his hands. Very important in itself, but yet he, he was not somebody that, that necessarily everybody in the neighborhood knew. He was, he was not in the news. He did, he did not, you did not see his name in the front page of the paper or even the back page as far as that's concerned. Simple. Not a ruler. Not a king. Was the young virgin girl that would give birth to the Savior of the world. And to the man that would would, would have hand in raising Jesus during his earthly life. My thoughts went to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What Paul said. He said, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. You see, God God is our qualifier. God is our qualifier. In the simplicity of what Christmas is about, it is God. God is the qualifier of all things in our life. He's the qualifier of you and I. You know, who God calls, I believe God equips. Who God, who, God, who God speaks to, I believe that he prepares us. We can look at the illustrations throughout scripture. Go, Goliath, Goliath, a giant of a foe, was defeated by a simple little boy. The Midianites, a army large and mighty and strong, was defeated by 300 just simple men not trained warriors. Moses was a simple man with a a speech impediment, but yet he led Israel out of Egypt. Naaman was sent by a simple little girl over to see Elisha that he could be healed of leprosy. A little boy with a simple little lunch fed a multitude of people at the blessing of Christ And that little boy would have leftovers to take back home. A great evangelist, known to the Pentecostal world especially, Dwight L. Moody was won to Christ by a simple little shoe salesman. I was led to Christ myself by a simple country pastor in a simple little Assemblies of God church and I had a simple Sunday school teacher, lovely little lady, has gone on to be with the Lord now. But she, she did not have a tremendous amount of education, but she loved her Sunday school class, and she loved God, and she taught us in the ways of the Lord. You see, God uses the simple things of life and the simple people of life to proclaim His will and his word and his way and to save the lost. You see, it it comes down to simple people like you and I this morning. And some of you I know carry so much more education than I do. 
Some of you are so much smarter than I am. Not many of you are better looking, okay? I'm just kidding. I, I know better than that. Some, not many of you, unless you're 12 years or younger, not many of you are shorter than me. I would be taller than I am right now had I not quit growing when I did. <laughs> I want you all to remember that. But the reality of it is, it's people just like you and me. It's, it's pe we, we don't have to, to have PhD behind our name. If we do, that's good. We, we, don't have to, we don't have to have any certain uh, type of clothing on or any of those things. But, but God wants to use us. He wants to take us right where we are and he wants to develop us and bring the kingdom of God forth through us. And that is exactly what he did when he became incarnate. He used a simple girl and he used a simple man and he used them to, to birth and to nurture God incarnate. Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one that would be and was not would be but was the Savior of the world, anointed of God. So God uses simple people. We also can learn from the story, the Christmas story, that God uses simple places. God uses simple places. Now, Bethlehem was the place where Jesus was born. And quite frankly, Right now, you know, even now, Bethlehem, in comparison to many American cities, Bethlehem is just a small place. It's still very primitive in, in, in a lot of ways. Not anything like you would, we would typically think. I hope that we go back to Israel someday in, uh, in the future, and I hope that some of you will, will, will be able to go with us back to Israel. It's a life-changing experience. But... Bethlehem is not fancy at all. Bethlehem is, is not, it, it doesn't have uh, subways, it doesn't have an airport, doesn't have a train station, or any of those things. I'm not even sure that it has a hotel. It may. But Bethlehem was and still is a simple place. It's a simple, simple town. But it's the place that, that God chose to be birthed here on earth. You see, sometimes, sometimes we think that some, something huge and big has to happen in our life for something to be birthed in us, a God thing to be birthed in us. But it doesn't at all. Because even the Christmas story itself displays to us that, that, that God says, I, I will be birthed in a simple place. On a rocky hillside, and that is all Bethlehem is. It's a rocky hillside. You go on out 52 here up to the, to the rock on top of the mountain. I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. I'm learning. But, but, but the, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, or if you go up on top of East River Mountain where all the rocks are, that, that, that is nothing compared to Rocky Bethlehem. But, but God says, you know, when, when I, where I choose, the simple places, those places where I choose, where I ordain, God says, I will carry out my work. We go back to little David. Little David was a simple young man in a simple place. He was out in the shepherd's field outside of Bethlehem. He was doing a simple job, but yet it, it was he that God would call and soon make king of Israel. The majority of the Apostle Paul's letter were not written from, from some penthouse luxury suite apartment in New York City. Most of his writings were written from the simplicity, if you would, of a prison cell. The great novel, some of you may have read it or seen the movie, Pilgrim's Progress. Much like Paul's writing, Pilgrim's Progress was written from a jail cell. Great, great inspiration if you've never read it. Read it sometimes. It's a never dying novel. But the reality of it is, wherever we're at, God can use us. He uses little places, simple places to work his will. 
You may reside in a simple little house on a dead-end street in a simple little neighborhood. You may live and think that, well, we're over here in the mountains of West Virginia and we're just simple little country people in a simple little church that sits up on the hill right beside of New Hope Road. You may be thinking, we, 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 we're not all that important. Nobody knows that we're here. And you may be right in the sense that most people don't know that you're here or where you're, li where you're living or that voice of praise even exists. But let me tell you this, but God knows where you live. And God knows what's happening at Voice of Praise. And God knows what's going on in Bluefield and Bluewell, West Virginia. And listen to me very carefully right now. And if God knows, that's the most important thing. And he was sent me here to tell you this morning that he knows the place wherein you dwell. And he knows who you are and you may feel simple and you may feel like you live simple but the truth of the matter is God says I can do great and mighty things among you. Amen. Can somebody praise God in this place right now? So simple people from simple places. Just doing simple things. Now, we, we live in a church age, especially in America. But it's not just in America, it's all over the world. We, we, live, in, we live in a church age where I, I think sometimes that our vision of mission has been distorted. I think sometimes, and, and listen to me, I've already met with the uh, met with the board and a few times already, and, and some of the leadership here, and and uh, and I, this is something I've shared. Now I'll continue to share this. By the way, I said I want us to quit saying that we're so we're we're a little church. I said we got to think we got to think big. We got to think big. We got we got we got to. We need to conduct ourselves as being big. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying now. I'm not, I'm not going to contradict myself. But sometimes we feel like because we don't have an auditorial to seat 5,000 or, or, uh, or we don't have the finance to, to have 15 or 20 paid staffers or we don't have this. We, sometimes we feel like, well, we just really can't do a whole lot. You see, in, in the church age, and I'm not, I'm not against the mega churches. Don't misunderstand me. I think they're well and good, and I think they serve their purpose. But realize with me this morning that the average church in America is actually less than 80 people. So voice of praise is still above average. Very much so. And the reality of it is, sometimes we sit back and we take on this attitude, well, we're, we're just not, we're, we, just, we just can't do what these other people do and we can't be what these other people be. The reality of it is, we are only called to do and only called to be what God wants us to be. And, and, and somehow, in our minds, we, we block that mentality. We put on the blinders and say, well, we're not trying to be like the church up the road or the church down the road or the church that we see on TV or the church we read about in the books. We're going to be exactly what God wants us to be and he's calling us to be. Simple people, simple places, and then God does simple things. Listen to this. We don't have to have the newest car or truck, especially if it's a Ford. We don't have to have the latest and greatest cell phone, even if it is an iPhone. We don't have to have a big house with a lot of stuff in it for God to use us. In fact, I would go as far to say as those things have no influence over God at all. He's not impressed. He's not impressed if you got on Armani suits or if you were wearing bibbed overalls. Okay? He, he's, not, he's not impressed if you're wearing floor shine shoes from Belk or if you're wearing a pair of worn-out Chuck Taylors from Goodwill. 
Those things don't impress God. They don't matter to him. They're, they're not important in his scope of doing ministry. So, so we have to realize that it's not about how much stuff we have or what the quality of stuff is we have. God uses simple things. You see, when we read this Christmas story, we find that the manger was not a crib, it was not a baby bed, but actually a manger in itself is a nothing more than a watering trough or a feeding trough. Now, we portray the manger, you know, in, our, in all of our programs, you know, we always use the wooden, you know, the wooden thing that's like this, and, and, and that's the way we portray the manger. I think the reason we've done that is because it is so much easier to make, because in ancient Israel, looking through the art, at the artifacts of ancient Israel, all of those things that were served in, in, the, in the livestock business and in the, the, the vineyards and what have you, everything was hewn out of stone. So a manger was actually, was just a little, about this long, about this wide probably, and it was carved out of a solid piece of stone. It was hollowed out, and, and it was recessed where they could put the feed and the water in it for the animals. That was Jesus' crib. Not, he didn't even have the luxury of wood. A simple, a simple birth in a simple place, in a simple manger that was used to feed the beasts when they would be brought in from a field, it all was just a simple occurrence. And the story, the Christmas story talks about the fact that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. When you search out that word swaddling, you find that it means nothing more than soft rags. Rags that are well worn. Rags that were probably used in the manger area to wipe down the animals. Whatever else needed to be do, done in taking care of those animals. Something like an old wore out rag that you would use to dust your furniture with. But that is what Jesus was wrapped in. Wrapped up in swaddling clothes. He didn't have on a christening gown. He didn't even have on the, 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 the latest baby fashion from one of the baby stores. He didn't have on a baby outfit from J.C. Penney that somebody gave Mary at the baby shower. Swaddling clothes, simple, very simple in their existence in itself. All of this is how the Savior of all humanity was born. Very simple. A simple arrival to simple people in a simple place. Now, he could have been born in a palace. Or he could have been born, I mean, time means nothing to God. He could have waited until hospitals were built and he could have been born in a, in a fancy hospital with the greatest of, of child care. He could have been born any place. He could have been born on any other place on the face of the earth. But God chose these simple things to come into the world. So we have to find ourselves realizing that in this Christmas time of year, we oftentimes get caught up in stuff. Not just in Christmas, but actually in all year round. We get caught up in stuff. We get caught up in things. We stress, the number one, the number one so, so it's said, the number one cause of divorce in America right now is financial pressure. Again, we buy stuff with money we don't have to impress stuff, to impress people that don't even really care. We find ourselves caught up in, in, in living a life when, when God is just calling us to simplicity. God is just calling us and, and everything, even his coming to the world. And even as Jesus for the next, following this birth that we're celebrating right now, this next 30 some years, we find that Jesus just lives his life as a simple man. 
From 12 years old to age 30, we know very little about Jesus other than the fact that he grew up as a carpenter's son and no doubt he inherited the trade from Joseph. Jesus did not live in fancy houses, drive fancy cars. In his case, it would probably be a fancy donkey, okay? But the reality of it is, Jesus was about his father's business. And in all his simplicity, he was fulfilling the plan of God. What's that have to do with me, pastor? It has everything to do with you and with myself. Because you understand that what God is calling us to is just to worship Him and serve Him in the simplicity of who He is. Amen? To serve Him and to worship Him in the simplicity of who He is. You know, I, I, again, I, I stress that I want us to do ministry and voice of praise in the spirit of excellence. I want us to begin to think big and not to say, well, we're just some little church, woe is me. I don't want us to be like that. I, I, I want us to have a vision and I want us to go forward. But the reality of it is, in all of that, we have to understand it has nothing to do with me and it doesn't have a whole lot to do with you either. Because the truth of the matter is, it is God is just calling us to simply serve Him and worship Him and allow Him to manifest through us in spirit and through the Word of God and then we will see the kingdom of God advance in a simple little town in the mountains of a simple little state called West Virginia and God will use voice of praise because He's going to use you to turn the world upside down. Well, I've never been to the other side of the world, Pastor. That's okay. You may not ever go there. I hope you do sometime. But I, I want every one of you to hold your hand up like this. And I want you to bring it in to touch the end of your nose. I'd like to have a picture of that. That's about as good as the plates. That's about as good as the plate. Let me tell you something. Right there, right there at the end of your nose is where the world begins. That's where the world begins. That's where your world begins. And as your world begins, only thing that you have to be mindful of is wherever my nose goes, there I'm going to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good news it brings. Amen. A simple gospel, a simple Lord, and a simple plan of salvation. Whitney, if you want to come back dear. So let's commit ourselves to worshiping God in the simplicity of whom He is. Jesus the Christ. Whether it's Christmas or it's the 4th of July. I worked with a guy several years ago and, 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 and I, I know none of y'all ever worked with anybody like this. But he, you know, this guy, this particular guy I worked with, he was just that person that didn't have many friends. Most of it was self-inflicted. I think he took grouchy pills on a regular basis. And I remember this like it's been now probably 16, 18 years ago. I can remember, and we all worked in the same office and he came in the office and he was, he was whistling, you know, he was whistling Jingle Bells or something, a Christmas song. And I couldn't resist it. Y'all find out. I don't have much resistance sometimes. I couldn't resist it. This guy, I, I, I hollered at him. I said, across, you know, we had these partitions. And I hollered. I said, are you all right? Yeah, I'm good. Why, why are you asking? I said, well, you seem happy. He said, well, I am happy. I said, well, you're not most of the time. He said, I'm always happy at Christmas. He said, I love Christmas. Christmas makes me happy. 
And I, can, I still consider him a friend. I haven't seen him in years, so don't misunderstand me when I tell this story. I said, well, I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I wish it was Christmas all year round then. <laughs> I said, he held a position in the company where he could give everybody a hard time if he so wanted to. Yes, sir, I wish it was Christmas all year round then so you whistle every day. But the truth of the matter is Christmas, the simplicity of Christmas should be something that we live in, we walk in, and we celebrate all the year round. It's a wonderful time, and I'm, I'm glad we have this time to celebrate the birth of Christ. I'm already looking forward to Easter when we celebrate the resurrection of the same Christ. It's wonderful to have those days, but the truth of the matter is we should live in them and walk in them every single day, every single season of our life. And maybe Christmas has been stressful to you up to this point. Maybe the whole thing, maybe you're ready for it to be over with. Maybe you're just, you know, ready for it to be done. But I hope this morning that the Spirit of the Lord will help you see that Christmas is so much more than just the hustle and the bustle. But Christmas is the simple plan of God to a simple people born in a simple place to bring simple things to pass in our life. God uses people just like us to do His will. You may be that person to carry forth His will in your family. You may be that person to carry forth His will on your job. You may be that person. You. You. In the book of Romans chapter 12, Paul wrote this. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Wow. I got Sister Sarah something for Christmas. That's good. The bad part about it is most of it she picked it out herself. She may even wrap some of it. I did get her a couple things she doesn't know. In this season when we're busy of getting getting and receiving and giving and we says Sarah and I appreciate those of you that have handed us cards and, and what have you. We do appreciate that by the way. But the reality of it is, the reality of it is, the most important person to receive a gift during this Christmas season is not your wife, not your husband, not your kids or those grandkids. But the most important person in this Christmas season to receive your gift is Jesus. Jesus. And what Paul wrote there to the Romans is applicable here this morning. Because what we can look at and say is, Jesus, I want you to have everything there is of me. You see, in Silent Night, that one stands and says, Lord at birth. Lord simply means that when something is Lord of your life, they have your everything. They're in full control. And lots of times we'll use that as a slang word. We'll say, oh, Lordy goodness. Or Lord, my mama was Lordy mercy. But the, in reality, when, when, when Jesus is truly Lord of our life, He has everything that there is for us to give up. Give Him. We're releasing it to Him. I am, and some of that may even become a little bit difficult. Living sacrifices, Paul said. I want to give sacrificially to my Lord. Have I ever spent money at Christmas that I didn't have? Yes, I have. 
Years ago, I found myself paying off credit cards one Christmas from the last Christmas. I don't do that anymore. I learn better. But a bankrupting, if anything that we can bankrupt is bankrupting who we are and giving it unto the Lord. Giving Him all that we got. I want you to bow your heads with me and just close your eyes just for a moment. In the simplicity of Christmas, in the simplicity of Christmas, maybe you have been stressed, maybe you're at your wit's end, maybe you're stressing over money that you don't have, maybe you're stressing over gifts you want to buy that you can't afford to buy, or maybe they, maybe that last whatever whatever that you want to buy was sold and you don't have time to get it and you can't even get it from Amazon now you're out of time you're stressing over those things maybe you're stressing over how you don't get all the food cooked before the family gets to the house let me tell you let's let go of the stress and let's realize that this is a time of year for us to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. God becomes incarnate Christmas Day. I would rather, and I hope you would too, rather have the peace of God in my heart than the peace of knowing that I just spent money that I didn't have on that Christmas present that they didn't need or peace of God in my heart knowing that rather than knowing that I bought the last Nintendo or whatever it may be simple God looking for simple people in simple places to do simple things and when I, when I say God's simple I'm not, I'm not, I'm not degrading him at all because sometimes we complicate God too much. Sometimes we think, well, I can't get saved or I can't live for Jesus because I can't do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to speak Christianese or any of that stuff. The real reality of it is, it's a simple plan of salvation by a simple Savior. So right now in this Christmas season, you may be sitting here this morning. You may have got all your gifts wrapped. They may be under the tree. Or you may have to go out on Christmas Eve and do all your shopping. Bless your heart if you do. But you're sitting here this morning. And out of all the Christmas gifts that you could give, Jesus is saying, won't you give yourself to me? Is there anybody in this house this morning with the heads bowed and the eyes closed. And I promise you, I will not embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to come back and grab you by the, the hand to bring you up here. But if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I need to give my life to Jesus this morning. That's my Christmas gift to Him. Would you raise your hand real quickly? Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Thank you for those hands that have been raised in this place. Because let me tell you, those of you that raised your hand, that is exactly what Christmas is all about. Exactly what Christmas is all about. You could be here, it could have been a while since you've really communed with God. You may be a little bit cold and indifferent. Backslidden if you would. It's a great season to rededicate your life to a simple gospel provided by a simple God looking for simple people from a simple place like right here in Blue Well this morning. This is what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Everybody in this room. And if you all haven't figured it out, yet I do this because it makes it just a little bit easier 
But no matter who you are and where you're sitting in this sanctuary this morning, if you slipped up your hand, that you need to give yourself to Jesus this morning. I like to have Christmas a few days early. I used to be hung up on Christmas Day. I didn't want to open any presents on Christmas Eve or anything like that till grandkids come along and then you find out you got to do some of it on another day, you know. So I'm, I'm not hung up on just opening presents on Christmas Day. I want us to open up some Christmas presents this morning. If you get what I'm saying. Those of you that slipped up your hand, I want you to unwrap yourself before the Lord. Present yourself before Him. You know who you are. And I promise you I wouldn't embarrass you, pull you out or anything like this. But let me tell you, everybody in this room that is saved had to give themselves to the Lord. Nobody in this room is saved. Nobody's going to heaven without going by Jesus. So we're all the same. Simple people with a simple God and a simple gospel and a simple plan of salvation. So I'm going to ask everybody that can and will to come to the front this morning. And if you slipped up your hand, I want you to make your way up here because I want to share some scripture with you and I want to, to let you know what the Lord thinks about your gift. You ever give a Christmas present and you, the first thing you say, oh, I hope you like it. Y'all ever do that? I hope you liked it. Did you like it? Well, I want to tell you, I want to, I want to share with you, if you raised your hand this morning, I want to share with you what Jesus, what Jesus says about your gift. So if you slipped your hand up, I'm going to, now I'm going to ask you to be a little bit brave. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you're one, maybe you didn't even slip your hand up this morning. But if you did, or if you were a little bit reluctant, and you was getting slip that hand up that you want to give yourself to the Lord, I want you to make your way right up here to the front. I don't want to embarrass you. I want Because I want to tell you what, all these other people that's standing around here, they're here for a purpose. They're here to cheer you on in Jesus. Amen? How many, how many people we got for cheer, cheer them on in Jesus? Amen? Amen. 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 Is there, are, there any, are there any others? There were several others that slipped their hand up. Anybody else? Let me tell you, out of everything I do in the kingdom of God, Everything I do in the kingdom, that I do in the kingdom of God in the name of ministry, there's no greater moment for me than when somebody says, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. What's your name? Robert. Robert. I want you to know, I, I, I want you to know today greatest decision that you could ever make for Christmas. Amen. And I, I want you to know, did you grow up in this church? Have you grown up? Okay. What I'm about to share with you is what the Word of God says. It's what Jesus says because Jesus says He said He was the Word become flesh. And you're about to embark on a walk. It's going to come by faith. You're probably going to feel real good when you leave here this morning. You'll have days that you feel real good. But there's going to be some days that you don't feel so awful good about things. Some days I, I, feel, I, some days I feel on fire for Jesus. Other days I feel right aggravated like yesterday driving back through Asheville, North Carolina. This guy in a little car just cut us off right in the middle of track. I didn't feel too saved at that moment. So your salvation is not based simply on what you feel. I want you to know that, okay? I want to share something with you from the Word of God. It's found in the 10th chapter of Romans. In the 
the 10th chapter of Romans, this is what Paul wrote. Moses describes the, in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteous, but the righteous that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who shall ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Paul gives the answer. Here's what, it, here's what your salvation is about. The word is near you. It is in your heart and in your mouth. Salvation, the ability to be saved, lies within you, in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You're giving him. You're giving him. He, you're his gift. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Black and white. Two sentences long. And he solidifies that by saying, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. That means made right, forgiven. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Simple plan of salvation simple plan of salvation I want some people to come over here and, and gather around Robert every, 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 everybody, everybody that's just tickled that Jesus saved you and you're tickled that Robert's given his heart to the Lord I just want you to get close you know amen amen and I want to pray with you Robert now Robert, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass you. Jesus saved me. Amen. 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 Are there any others? Any others in this place? I tell you something. That is that is something to celebrate. That is something to celebrate. Bless you, Robert. You have a Bible. Okay. Make sure that you mark what I just shared with you in your Bible. Okay, I'll help you with that if you need help. Anybody else slipped your hand up this morning? Maybe you didn't slip a hand up, but you need to, you want to give yourself to Jesus. Anybody else? Okay. Let me tell you something. One, I should say one of the most, but one thing that did excite me when I came over here to look around the church and was interviewed and what have you. One of the things that excited me is this church has a baptistry. And somebody said it hadn't been used in a long time. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Somebody said that. I don't even remember who said it. But I want to tell you, it's fixing to be used. Amen. Amen. It's fixing to be used. And I'm counting on using it on you, Robert. And maybe several others of you as well. Anybody need special prayer for your body or any, any matter this morning before you return to your seats? Okay. Okay. Ashley uh, or Leslie is standing in for her neighbor that was in the shooting incident the other night. So let's just pray. Fathers, we come to you, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, for everyone that was injured the other night. Some weren't injured physically, but we know they were injured so emotionally, God. But I pray that you'll minister to those in the hospital right now, Lord God. Lord, let well-being be restored to their body, Jesus. I just believe that right now today, God, that you're healing the wounds, Lord, we, we believe that you're removing the infections, Lord. We believe that today, God, that you're restoring everything to this family. Lord, we even ask that you minister to the perpetrator, Lord. We just believe, God, that you're speaking to his heart. And 
God, you're, 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 Lord, you're dealing with him. And God, we believe, Lord, that there is salvation for him as well. And God, I just believe that, that Lord, that you're ministering, Lord, in each of the family members, far extended, in his community. God, you're healing, Lord God, the hurt that is left behind. And God, we don't understand why things like this happen, sort of it just being the man of sin at work. But God, we just believe, Lord, that some way, somehow, Lord, that you will be glorified when all is said and done. And Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and glory and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for we believe it's been accomplished in your name. Amen. 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 Did you want to pray this morning? Anybody else this morning need special prayer? Amen. Well, if not, you can return to your seat. We have had a we have had a great morning this morning morning let me say thanks thank you to let's give sister Pam and the children let's give them another uh, hand for the children's presentation this morning let's also let's all show also show honor to the praise team let me tell you I understand what doing Christmas songs are like. You don't play them all year long until Christmas. And, and, and they're not necessarily the easiest to, to, to take on. But let's give the praise team a hand. They did a great job leading in Christmas worship this morning. Don't forget to get your bulletin. Look through the things that are in the bulletin. In particular, you will find an, a little insert reminder about prayer and fasting time forthcoming. Please, please consider that. If you haven't been here on Wednesday nights, we can give you the prayer guides and all of those things that we've utilized on Wednesday night. We will put those into your hand. Uh, I believe it is going to be a life-changing month in January for Voice of Praise. Also, the youth trip. Uh, make sure you get those release forms back to, to Brother Dave and Sister Alicia. Uh, Christmas banquet last week. Man, we just had a blast. And uh, we had a good time. I hope you all did too. And uh, hopefully we can do more of those in the future. Last but certainly not least, I want to go ahead and announce this, 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 this morning, even though it wasn't in your bulletin. If you are, if you serve in leadership in Voice of Praise, and that means if you have a, an assigned responsibility, okay, in Voice of Praise, we, uh, we're going to have a joint leadership meeting on January 6th. That is a Tuesday evening at 6.30. Uh, I think we'll probably do it in the dining area, but we want you to be here. I want, I want us to come together as leadership because as goes leadership, so will go the rest of Voice of Praise. And I want us to, uh, I want us to uh, just spend some time sharing with you. We'll try not to make it real long. It won't be in specific detail per department, but we do want to come together and share with our leadership, our vision, our ministry vision for Voice of Praise. Listen, Merry Christmas to everybody. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Make sure you let us know when you need something. I want you to look at that person that's next to you. And I want you to announce to them, I am blessed. I am highly favored of God. Good looking and got plenty of money. <laughs>